Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another of the Kirby Institute seminar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Bedigal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the format to the seminar will start off with a presentation uh, followed by a Q&A at the end uh, to ask a question, click on the icon in the speech bubble and question mark in the top right corner to open the Q&A chat panel. When you click on ask a question, please remember to write your name. This will help us reference your question and make answering easier. So it's a, a great pleasure to introduce Bezad, uh, Dr. Bezad Jari Zidar, um, who's a clinical epidemiologist and a senior lecturer at the Kirby Institute at UNSW. Uh, he trained as a medical practitioner and undertook his MPH in Iran before coming to Australia in 2009, initially uh, in Melbourne, uh, and then moved up to the Kirby Institute where he undertook his PhD. Uh, his research interests include viral hepatitis, natural history and clinical care in prison settings and among people who inject drugs. And it's been a great pleasure to work with Bezad uh, over the last decade. Uh, and Bezad's going to present some key findings from the Strop C project. And I just wanted to acknowledge um, Andrew Lloyd as the co-leader of the Strop C project and also Marion Byrne, who's been a real driver of the project over the last five years, as well as Stuart Loveday, who chaired our protocol steering committee. Um, so thanks for joining and take it away, Bezad. Thank you very much, Greg, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, and also thank you for the opportunity to, to present uh, in this webinar. Uh, as Greg said, uh, I'm going to present the, the Stop C study, which is a treatment as a prevention, hepatitis C treatment as prevention trial uh, in the prison. That's a five years project which was uh, led by Andrew Lloyd and uh, Greg Dore, and I have the, the pleasure to actually to present the findings. And uh, yeah, Greg acknowledged Stuart and Marianne. I also wanted to acknowledge them. Uh, I think Marianne is among the audience. I'm not sure about the Stephen, but I hope he is as well. Just a quick background. In many countries, including Australia, people who inject drugs and uh, people who are incarcerated, they are actually the, the key population in any sort of HCV control uh, projects, given the, the high prevalence and high incidence of hepatitis C in these uh, populations. Treatment as prevention, that's actually a concept that uh, introduced to use a treatment as a tool for limiting or controlling the spread of the of a virus or any infection in a defined epidemics uh, in a particular setting. Treatment as prevention was initially introduced and used in the context of HIV therapy and there are some studies showing the feasibility and impact of HIV treatment as prevention but uh, there are not much data about hepatitis C treatment as prevention. Uh, there are some mathematical modelings that uh, they demonstrated the potential for HCV prevention, uh, treatment as prevention uh, among people who inject drugs and also in the prison setting, but there is no real world data to actually confirm the uh, model based uh, projections. Then given this background in sub C, we were trying to evaluate the impact of uh, DAA treatment scale up on HCV incidence and, and actually uh, try to evaluate the HCV treatment as prevention uh, in the prison setting. Then the hypothesis was that the rapid DAA treatment scale up in the prison could reduce HCV transmission and the, the measures for HCV transmission was uh, incidence of primary infection and also incidence of reinfection. Okay, there are four 
prison sites in stop C, two maximum security prisons and two medium security prisons, uh, all of them in New South Wales. Maximum security prisons included Goulburn and Lithgow. Both uh, are men only prisons. Medium security prisons included OMMPCC and Dilwinia. OMPC is men only and uh, Dilwinia is women only prisons. Then overall we had uh, three men only prisons and the one women only prison uh, in the sub -seat. In, terms, in terms of the participants, all prison inmates uh, over the age of 18 were eligible uh, to be enrolled in the study, regardless of their hasty infection status, their risk behaviors, or uh, the sentence or remand status. The, all the participants, they were tested for HCV at enrollment, HCV antibody, and if it is positive, HCV RNA. Then we had three groups at the enrollment, three groups of participants. People uh, with HCV antibody negative, they are the people who did not have any exposure to HCV, and also obviously they are uninfected. The people with HCV antibody positive, but HCV RNA negative, they are the people who had exposure previously, but they cleared the virus either spontaneously or by uh, treatment. And at this stage, they are not infected. And people with positive antibody and RNA, they are the people who are currently infected and living with hepatitis C. Then for these two first group, the people with uninfected and previously infected, because they are at risk of ACV, uninfected people, they are at risk of primary infection and previously infected people, they are at risk of reinfection. These people, they were tested for HCV every three to six months. And people with infection with HCV RNA positive, they just went under some pre-treatment clinical assessment, like for example, a fiber scan uh, or evaluation of the drug drug interaction. And then the infected people in the initial phase of the study, which was actually pre a treatment scale up, the people referred for HCV treatment to the prison health service. The HCV treatment was standard of care, uh, which was interferon based treatment until March 2016. Uh, then at that time, DAA treatment was PBS listed. Then from to, uh, March 2016 onward, uh, the, the, the people received DAA treatment through prison health services. But in the second phase of the study, which is actually the DAA treatment scale of phase, all HCV RNA positive people, they were offered DAA treatment through stop C, which was uh, sophosphorus via potassium for 12 weeks. And this is a, actually the uh, graphical presentation of the study. And as you can see, uh, the recruitment started in different times in different prisons. The recruitment started in Goulburn at the first uh, prison site in October 2014. In Litgo, the second maximum security prison, we started recruitment in the second half of 2015 in June 2015, and in two medium security prisons, uh, treatment started in April 2016. Treatment scale-up also started slightly differently in uh, Goulburn and Litgo. It start, started from July uh, 2017, and in two medium security prisons, a treatment scale up started in October 2017. And both surveillance and treatment scale up continued just up to the end of the study, which is end of 2019. Okay, this is the participant flow, but that's very small. I have to zoom in. Uh, a total number of 3,691 participants enrolled. 
at enrollment, 719 of them, they were uh, positive and about 2,900 people, they were ACV negative. As you can see in the ACV negative people, among, uh, among this population, about 50% of them, they did not have any follow-up visit after enrollment. The majority of them due uh, to just releasing from the prison or transferring to another prison, which is actually reflecting the highly dynamic of the prison population. The same uh, observed in the ACV RNA positive population as well. Uh, less than 50%, they did not have any follow-up visits. And 416 people, they had one follow-up visit, which means that we would be able to offer them treatment. Then in the P ACV, uh, ACV positive people with follow-up, 340 of them, they received ACV treatment, the majority through stop C, but some of them through the prison health or in the community. 21 people, they, there was no record of ACV treatment for these people, but they had ACV negative test after enrollment and during the follow-up, then they could actually contribute to the incidence analysis and the rest of the people, they did not receive uh, ACV treatment again the majority of them uh, because of the transferring on release to freedom. Then uh, we had a total number of 1,643 people with a negative ACV uh, test during the follow-up who contributed to the incidence analysis. About 1,400 of them, they had negative uh, tests at enrollment. These 21, I told you they had negative after uh, a positive result and there were 165 people who received treatment and they had a uh, response to treatment then they were negative after treatment and they had follow-up after that and then they could contribute to the incidence analysis as well and among the total negative population with follow-up uh, which actually they included 1,818 person year follow up in total. 106 uh, participants, they had incident infections. And five of them, they had more than one episode of incident infections. Then in total, we had 111 episodes of uh, incident ACV infections in 106 people. Okay, this is the background characteristics of the participants. Uh, we had different recruitment numbers from different prisons. The majority of them, as expected, they were male because we had more men prison than the women prison. The median age was uh, 33, 27% indigenous Australians. Uh, 71 of them, they had previous imprisonment. In terms of the Injecting drug status, 55% of the population, they had history of injecting or they had recent injecting. 21% they had previous injecting but not in the current imprisonment. 4% they injected in the prison but uh, longer than six months ago. 5% they injected in the prison two to six months ago, and these 22%, 797 people, they were actually had recent injecting. They, they injected in the past month in the prison. And in this population, the kind of people with recent injecting, these 797 people, the majority of them, 49%, they injected at least daily, a very large proportion, 89% of them, they shared syringe or uh, needles in the prison and 91% they, they shared any injecting equipment, either needle or syringe or any other injecting equipment. Okay, there was a concern about, that because we had a very uh, 
large proportion of loss to follow up or the people who had only one visit and no follow up visit after uh, enrollments. Uh, there was concern of a possible selection bias towards maybe higher risk or lower risk of people who stayed in the study. Then in this table, we compared the basic characteristics of the people with no follow up and the people who had at least one follow up. And you can see that the distribution of the variables are pretty much comparable, except for the duration of a stay in the prison, which as expected, the people who did not have follow up, they had shorter duration of stay. They had the, the median uh, duration was six months compared to 14 months among the people who had at least one follow up assessment. But the other characteristics, the distribution of other characteristics were pretty much similar. In terms of the HCV prevalence, at enrollment, 19% of the population, they had positive HCV RNA, which means they had HCV infection. But it is interesting that this prevalence was not consistent across the uh, different months of enrollment. The people who enrolled at the beginning of the study up to June 2016, about 30% of them, they had HCV. Then the prevalence was 30% at that stage. But after that, as you can see, there is a kind of decreasing trend in the HCV prevalence over time, which is a kind of reflective of the treatment uptake uh, mainly in the community and also in the prison as well. Then uh, during the time in the, in the later stages of the study, we had uh, lower uh, prevalence. And these are the prevalences among the new uh, enrollees, the people who enrolled uh, at that specific time span. But in, in the other, in this graph, we only looked at the new prison entrants, then the people who enrolled within six months of entering the prison. And why we did that? Because these, the prevalence in this population, it is more reflective of the HCV prevalence in the community because they are just uh, coming to the prison. Then, but you can see, uh, the same pattern. Relatively higher prevalence at the beginning, ab about 25%, decreasing through the time with about 11% at the uh, last six months of the study. Then it shows that uh, just regardless of the intervention, because of the treatment uptake in the community and also a little bit in the prison, we had a kind of already decreasing prevalence of HCV among the, among the prisoners. Okay, HCV treatment. 499 people, they had positive uh, HCV RNA. 416 of them, they had positive uh, HCV at the baseline and 83 people, they had incident HCV during the follow-up with no spontaneous clearance. Then they were eligible for treatment as well. Uh, the, through a stop C, we uh, treated 324 people. 65% of them, they stayed in the prison until the end of the treatment and they completed the treatment, but 35% they exited before treatment completion. Again, another uh, point that shows the very highly dynamic of prison population. Among 143 participants who completed treatment and also they had SVR 12 assessments, only two of them they had a virological failure or relapse. The majority of them they, uh, they responded to treatment and they had SVR. Uh, another important point to mention before going to the incidence results is that, as I mentioned, the majority of the people who receive treatment, they receive treatment through sub C, but still uh, a proportion of them, they receive treatment through the prison health or in the community. But the important point is that, although we started treatment scale up in 
2017 from June, but actually it is in the second half of 2017 that we uh, observed the real treatment scale up because uh, the two uh, medium security prisons, they started treatment scale up at, the, at in October 2017 and also it took time for the two other prisons to uh, really see the treatment scale up. Then for the incidence analysis and for to compare pre-treatment scale up and post-treatment scale up, we compared up to 2017 compared to the 2018 onward. Then we split the time from here and we compared 2014 to 2017 as a kind of pre-treatment scale up period and 2018 onward as a post-treatment uh, post scale-up period. And this is the longitudinal incidence that you can see. At the beginning of the study, the incidence was about uh, close to 7 per 100 person years. Then you observe the kind of increasing trend in the incidence up to the end of 2017, and then a sharp a decline was observed after that and which was a kind of relatively stable with some fluctuations in the post treatment scale of period. And a more or less similar pattern you can see in the incidence of primary infection and also reinfection. A kind of decrease after treatment scale up. It is in the primary infection and in reinfection you also see a reduction in incidence after treatment scale up. But uh, there, is a, there was a question here. If this reduction that you are seeing here is purely due to the intervention or maybe at least a part of that is due to the decreasing prevalence of ACV, that I showed you in the in the previous slide. This is something that we needed to investigate more. And for this, to answer this question, we did a kind of interrupted time series regression analysis, which, which was adjusted for calendar time as uh, to be adjusted for the underlying trend and also for the ACV prevalence among the new prison entrants. And the analysis showed a significant result. The uh, adjusted incidence rate ratio was 0.43 and it was statistically significant. And in the graph, you can see that this red line here, this is the observed trend before treatment scale up. And this is the projected trend without considering any intervention. And this is the trend, the observed trend after treatment scale up. Then the kind of graphically uh, showing uh, the, the impact of treatment scale up on the changing the, the trend of the incidence in this figure. Just looking at the, the, the now in this analysis, we looked at two time periods or actually we compared two time periods with each other using a kind of average of incidence in each time period. Then the HCV incidence, both primary and the infection altogether, in the first period 2014 to 17, before treatment scale up, the incidence was 8.3 per 100 person years. But after that, it decreased to 4.3 per 100 person years, about 50%, 48% reduction in the incidence which was statistically significant. But looking at the different uh, risk groups, if you looking at the people who never injected, you can, that's actually not, uh, you cannot see any significant result here. About 25% decrease in risk, but not statistically significant. The largest impact is observed among the people with a history of injecting. In the people with a history of injecting, but not in the current imprisonment, or at least they, they did not report any injecting in the current imprisonment. 
we observed 60% reduction in the in the risk in the incidence. As you can see, uh, the incidence rate ratio. And in the people who injected in the current imprisonment, we had a 53% reduction in the uh, incidence, which was both of them, they were statistically significant. This is the same analysis, but looking at only the HCV primary infection incidence. You can see still a significant result and actually the the, the incidence reduction is larger, 57% uh, reduction in the risk, no significant result in the never injected group, and significant results in, the, in both the history of inject, people with history of injecting and people with, who injected in the prison. In the reinfection, what the, the kind of magnitude of impact is not as large as what we observed in the primary infection. In the total population, you can, uh, yeah, we saw about 40% uh, reduction, marginally significant, but looking at the uh, intervention groups, uh, sorry, in the, in the risk groups, the results was not significant. Okay, but the previous analysis uh, was unadjusted. We just looked at the, the change in the risk uh, before and after treatment scale up. In this one, it is a kind of Cox uh, hazard model. Looking at the hazard of HCV before and uh, after treatment scale up, but adjusted for several other covariates as a kind of potential confounders. And after adjustment, still you can see a 50% uh, reduction in hazard or in the risk, which was statistically significant. The other factors contributed to the, uh, or as a kind of predictive of the risk reduction was age. Then older age was associated with the lower risk also previous uh, imprisonment, injecting drug use as expected, the people who injected in the last six months in the prison, they were uh, about, they had a, uh, about six times higher risk of infection. And also you can see different risk in different prisons. Then we did not have a kind of consistent risk, risk across the prisons, particularly in the Dilvinia in the in the women prison, we had the highest risk of infection. Okay, conclusion. Subseed is the first HCV treatment uh, as prevention study in the prison, and uh, actually the largest in any setting. And these results provide a uh, a kind of empirical evidence of HCV treatment as prevention. And we showed that HCV incidence almost halved following rapid scale up of the DAA treatment. And it was interesting that the magnitude of HCV treatment as prevention was larger against primary infection than reinfection. There is explanation that for the reinfection, we did not have uh, actually enough person to follow up then some of these non-significant result could be related to maybe the, the limited power, but our data showed that the magnitude of impact was larger in the primary infection. And also it was uh, larger in the, in, the, in the population who reported injecting drugs, which are actually more important population in terms of the HCV control. And the last point is that the, probably the combination of the, the rapid treatment scale up and also uh, improved HCV prevention strategies in the prison, then it could end up even having a greater impact of HCV prevention. Okay, just 
acknowledgement. Yeah, that uh, Stop C was a partnership project uh, with several partners, uh, the, the government bodies, the university, the uh, community organizations, the industry, then all of these organizations, they had real great input into the project. And also, this is a list of the, the protocol steer, uh, steering committee and also at the end, these actually the site research coordinator, the stop seeing nurses who have done uh, greatly in this study. Back to you, Greg. Thanks very much, Basa. Um, clearly, Stop C was a major project over five years and really nice to see those results presented. Uh, in public. Um, so we've got uh, a question to start off from uh, Kyle at Hepatitis New South Wales. A good question. Um, hi, Bayside. Is there a reason Eclusa was used over Maverick or any other DA uh, for the treatment in the project? Yeah, that's a good question. The main reason was that Maverick was not available at the time that we started treatment, uh, we started the project. Now that Maverick is also available, yet I think there are two options, and maybe Maverick because of the shorter uh, period of treatment, maybe there are some superiority for the Maverick to be used in the prison setting. I mean, we should also acknowledge that when we planned this study um, in 2000 and early in early 2014, in fact, um, we initially pitched the study to Gilead, um, and we we're looking for private sector funding to get things moving. And at that stage, back in 2014, Eclusa wasn't even licensed. It had been shown to be effective. It was sort of moving through um, towards sort of licensing, but it was the first pan-genotypic regimen that's going to be available. So we were really keen to have one regimen that wasn't a genotype-specific regimen uh, within the context of the study. Um, so that's, that's why you know, we went forward uh, with Eclusa um, you know, and the funding from Gilead. The, the study itself was funded both from uh, Gilead and an HMRC uh, partnership grant. Okay, just waiting for other questions to come through. Um, while we wait, um, basically, I think maybe uh, in the context of the question of primary infection versus reinfection, um, what do you think in terms of characterization or detection of reinfection events in the period 2014 to 2017 versus the sort of post-treatment scale-up uh, period? Yeah. yeah, that's I think very important question. The first uh, point is that uh, at, at the earliest stage of any treatment scale-up uh, actually uh, intervention, we are a kind of expecting higher rate of uh, reinfection. And the reason is that when you treat people, uh, they will be at the risk of reinfection. And when you do the treatment scale up, it means that uh, after treatment, uh, there are uh, a, a large population that they are at the risk of reinfection. Then, uh, we, we, we assume a higher rate of infection shortly after treatment scale up, but after uh, continuing the, the treatment scale up and reducing the reservoir, the reservoir of the virus uh, in the sense of that, then uh, we expected decreasing reinfection as well. And the other important point about reinfection is that uh, when you, when you uh, test people, for example, in, in the interval of three months or six months, it is possible that we could not detect reinfection and particularly among the people who get reinfected and clear the virus spontaneously shortly after that. These are the people who actually we could not detect them. Then probably if, if there the are studies showing that the shorter interval of testing uh, can actually detect more reinfection in the population. Yeah, thanks, Basil. Um, there's a question from our chair, Stuart Loveday, um, and Stuart asks, uh, given the results of the STOP-C study and also with the current uh, DA treatment rates provided 
by ongoing prison health services, are we likely to achieve Hep C elimination in prison by the target year 2028 in New South Wales, 2030 nationally through DA treatment alone, or do we need broader harm reduction interventions such as prison-based NSP in order to achieve elimination? Yeah, that, that's a very important question again. I'm not sure if I have enough data to answer this question. Uh, I know that uh, the treatment uptake in the prison uh, is increasing, particularly in, I think in the in 2019, we had much higher treatment uptake than the previous year. Then probably we need some sort of uh, modeling studies to see what is actually in the, in the years ahead or what level of treatment uptake we need to be able to achieve the ACV elimination in the prison. Yes, yeah, I should make the point that we've been really fortunate to collaborate closely with uh, Peter Vickham and, and Natasha Martin who are undertaking a couple of key sort of modeling projects. So we'll be looking at uh, various sort of interventions uh, in terms of uh, the impact on hep C incidents in the prison sort of setting and using data from STOP C. I think one of the things to acknowledge is, as you outlined, is the incredibly high rate of uh, needle syringe sharing uh, within the population of STOP C. And there's no doubt that when people are incarcerated, they reduce their frequency of injecting, but they in increase their rates of sharing enormously because of the lack of access to needle syringe programs. So in a sense, you would anticipate that needle syringe programs should have a, an, an even greater effect in the prison setting than in the community because of the lower frequency of injecting. So uh, that'll be part, I think, of the modeling work as we go, go forward. Um, there's a question from Carla, um, and congratulations, Carla, on the 30th anniversary of the Centre for Social Research and Health. Uh, she asks, now that the results are starting to be disseminated, uh, have you seen any interest in scale up of treatment prevention in prison? That's from Carla Trelaw. Uh, maybe it, it is still a little bit early to, this is actually the first time that uh, maybe, yeah, we had a poster presentation in EASL in the European conference, but it was a kind of virtual presentation. I'm not sure how uh, proud was the, uh, uh, the message actually went. But yeah, I expect or I hope actually to see interest, but still kind of early to talk about this, I think. Okay, thank, thanks, Baz. Um, I think that it does point to the role that we have in terms of you know, getting the messages out from Stop C, um, and hopefully we'll have the primary manuscript uh, published uh, in the coming sort of uh, weeks or months, uh, and that'll be a sort of you know, a launch pad to, to really advocate strongly uh, for enhanced uh, treatment scale up. Uh, just to sort of note, I mean, many people may be aware, but um, despite the declining overall numbers of hep C treatment across Australia uh, over recent years and that have continued in the first six months of 2020, and are possibly partly uh, due to the impact of COVID. Um, in fact, the numbers of treatment within Justice Health in New South Wales have been pretty stable, uh, a little bit lower January, February, March, but back up again, uh, April, May, June. Um, so pretty similar really to numbers in 2019, uh, whereas the community treatment numbers have really continued to sort of decline. Um, so it says a lot, I think, about the sort of proactive um, you know, programs that New South Wales uh, Health have uh, instituted and the work of uh, Justice Health and, and Corrections uh, in terms of making it possible uh, for treatment access in New South Wales. And really, uh, New South Wales clearly does lead uh, the world probably in terms of uh, the programs that they've been able to institute. Um, next question is from Diane Houchar. Um, hi Baza, did the study observe any relationships with linkage to care or would this be a question for uh, another study? Uh, I suppose in terms of uh, um, were people sort of readily coming forward and being happy to be involved in terms of linking to care and being part of the study? Actually, linkage to care was very, very good in, in this study, and uh, you know, the the vast majority of the uh, of the participants with with hepatitis C who did not receive treatment uh, was due to just they released or they transferred uh, after the enrollments. Then that was the reason. We had very 
few people who withdraw the consent on or they were not willing to to proceed for the treatment then i think i think this is something that uh, even in the in the prison health in the standard of care practice also we can see that the linkage to care is, is very good in the prison. Yeah, I think the other thing to point out, um, you know, we've been very fortunate um, within the study uh, to work closely with Carla Trelaw and her team at the Centre for Social Research and Health in terms of qualitative uh, work in Stop C. And some of the earlier sort of qualitative uh, work made us a little bit concerned in terms of uh, the, uh, people's uh, attitudes to treatment in the context of potential reinfection. So you know, a lot of people who were uh, involved in the qualitative interviews were, you know, were voicing some sort of reticence and concern around issues around you know, reinfection and not potentially saying they may not come forward for treatment because of that. Um, so it was sort of very encouraging and maybe it was because the qualitative work was done a little bit you know, earlier than when the treatment scale up occurred, that uh, when we got to that sort of time point, um, that people did seem to be very, very keen to sort of come forward for treatment during the scale up phase. And there was relatively few people uh, that were viremic uh, during that period that weren't happy to sort of go on to treatment. Um, a question, another question uh, from Anonymous, uh, was there any evidence for transmission of resistant uh, HCV in the prison? It, that, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we have not looked at this uh, question yet, but uh, because we have the samples uh, collected from uh, all the participants, and but this is uh, one of the studies that Andrew Lloyd is uh, working on that, and this is, uh, we, 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 this definitely this is something that we want to look at. I should, um... So I should probably add that I should add that um, when we looked at the sort of on treatment and the end of treatment uh, responses, um, people were you know, RNA undetectable at the end of treatment, and the adherence to the treatment was incredibly high. Um, so in terms of creating opportunities for viral resistance, um, there was not that sort of suboptimal adherence that might sort of lead to a greater sort of risk of, uh, of resistant sort of virus post-treatment. Um, so it will be interesting to have a look at to see uh, whether there is resistant resistance around, but my feeling is that there probably isn't a lot of resistant virus, but uh, we'll be able to outline that with some further sequencing. Um, next question is, um, have you found have your findings of incident infection in prisons driven any policy change with respect to NSP and harm reduction? So within New South Wales, I suppose. Yeah, that's a kind of tricky question. Uh, no, I don't know any any policy change that I'm aware of. Yeah, great if you want to add something. So I I suppose a couple of points to make. Um, if we talk about harm reduction, there's clearly two you know, key components of harm reduction in the prison setting. Um, one is needle and switch program access, and there's obviously lots of people in the public health sector that are advocating quite strongly for that to happen. Um, but there's also access to opioid agonist therapy. Um, and this is one more sort of component of the Stop C study we want to uh, interrogate with further analyses to sort of look at predictors of uh, coverage of OAT in the population because we have very detailed uh, injecting risk behaviour as well as OAT uh, access coverage uh, data. Um, but there's no doubt that over the last sort of 12 months uh, with the availability of depo buprenorphine that there's been a big push within Justice Health to roll out, so to speak, uh, depot buprenorphine uh, across the prison system. And I haven't seen uh, more recent data in terms of OAT coverage, but my feeling would be that coverage probably has improved uh, following the end of the, the Stop C study. Um, as I said, that's one component, and we think that will have an impact in terms of uh, hep C sort of risk within the prison setting, but ultimately uh, sort of the, sort of the holy grail 
would be to have a package of interventions that included uh, Neil's fringe programs as well. Um, it's not going to happen you know, next week or next month, but I think we need to continue to advocate strongly for it. Okay, so no more questions coming through. So um, I'll just take this opportunity to really uh, thank Bezad for a, a wonderful uh, presentation and a great sort of Q and A sort of uh, session, Bezad. And uh, and really thank you for all the work that you've done for the Stop C project and more broadly uh, within the Kirby Institute. And thanks everyone for joining the seminar. <laughs>